Don't forget to record. <laughs> Let's see. It's going to take me a second here. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm, uh, I believe, I'm, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. The recording has started. So let's turn our, our Bibles to uh, Revelation chapter 12. It's always good to go back to the Bible, of course, naturally. Good morning, everyone. And it's a beautiful Sabbath morning here. It's been raining and uh, we got a big downpour, which was just beautiful because uh, we really, really need it. And so I'm so thankful for the, the rain and the, the sun, but especially the rain right now because we really, really needed it. it. Started scaring me last night, though. I thought my whole mountainside was going to come down after me. I was going to start surfing the rest of the way down or something because it was really loud. But uh, I really was thankful. This morning's message is Psalms 2.6. Uh, we're still in the long, hot summer. And we're understanding Revelation chapter 12, where the theme there is a woman, the dragon, the seed, and the seed's seed, which is where we are in the scheme of the heavenly sanctuary and in the concept of the Hebrew feast, remember, between the spring feast and the autumn feast. In every single person's life in the natural world, we have a spring and then an, what comes after spring? Summer. summer. After summer comes all, all, fall. Yes, fall. Okay, so just remember to put that concept in. And so spiritually, we are in what's called a long, hot summer in our study, which extends from 34 AD from the stoning of Stephen. And by the way, the stoning of Stephen, you have to remember, um, there's these understandings in the Bible of type and type you find in Matthew chapter 24, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. That's the this understanding theme of and principle and the type, anti-types. And the stoning of Stephen, you have to remember that that's going to recur again. So if you want to understand what the stoning of Stephen is going to be like in the end time, as it was, so it will be, go back and study a little bit more about the stoning of Stephen. The whole characters, who's, who's the players, how is this unfolding, what was he preaching, what was he teaching, what was going on around him, you know, build yourself an understanding and a study, man, you'll sit there for, you can sit there for months, Unpacking that and connecting the dots to the end times. And who would be the one that is going to take the place of Stephen in the end times? Jesus. No, not Jesus. Jesus is, a, is, no. is, is ministering in the most holy place. Oh, I see. So who would be replacing? Stephen wasn't a, a representation in this concept as Jesus he was representing who? God's true, God's true people. So put that into perspective. Now you have another study to, to study. Should keep you busy for a while there. Okay? Okay, so let's read Revelation chapter 12 again. Let's get, get, gather together some uh, pieces of the puzzle here about the woman, the dragon, the seed, and the seed seed. Okay. Verse one, now a great sign appeared in heaven and a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head, a garland of 12 stars. Now, something else I want to remind you of that here, there's one woman, one woman. How many women are in the book of Revelation when it comes to, there's two women. Where do you find the other woman? Revelation 17, remember? There's a woman that rides a beast, and she's a harlot, okay? But here in Revelation 12, we have one woman, okay? And it identifies who that woman is. Okay, let's continue on. Verse 2. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Now, are we, because of the word then, are we not looking at a timeline? 
something to do with time because the word then exists in that verse. Then would refer to a concept of time, right? Right? So, okay. What does the King James say? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that would still give a concept. Yeah, it's still and and then. Right. Now, now put that into perspective because what you're reading is a timeline. Okay. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a fiery red dragon, great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems or crowns on his head. And a tail, and his tail, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her male child as soon as it was born. Are we still looking at a timeline here? This is a timeline. You understand that? All right. Who, who's the timeline? I mean, uh, who's the child? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. So she was she bore a male child, verse five, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Is that not a timeline? Can you not go back and see how that happened, how that unfolded? We do, we have that in the Bible. You can go to Acts chapter one. You can go to Revelation chapter four. You can see the concepts unfolding in more detail in those verses, in those chapters. Okay. Verse six, then the woman, same woman, isn't it? It's the woman. That is a single definite article. So it's the woman. It's the same woman that we're talking about. It's not a different woman. It hasn't changed. Okay. Then, the, and there, I don't know, what, what's the King James say? And, okay. And, and then, obviously, you're coming from the same Greek word. You could say, and then. Yeah. Well, the, the, the purpose, though, or the, the concept here in the Greek is that the and and the then is coming from the same Greek word. Yeah. And they're interchangeable, okay? Then, or and, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that she would, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Is that not a timeline? What is the 1,260 days? What is that? That is a, that's a times, times, yes, correct. That's time, times, and half a time. Is that the same con? Is that the same time period? Yes, it is. 1,260 days. And then we use the biblical prophecy principle, right, of a day for a year. You know why we do that, right? Because any other concept, if you just put, how many is 1,260 days? Literally. It's what? 1,260 years. No, literally. What is 1,000? Yeah. Convert that into years. How many years is 1,000? It's one, uh, yeah, it's three and a half years. Yeah. Did anything oh. happen to God's people for three and a half literal years? Can we mm -hmm. search anywhere in history? Or, there's nothing that occurred in this concept in three and a half literal years. Now, what's funny is, is it, Right, but that had, but he already been caught up to his throne, so it couldn't be that, right? And did did Mary run to the wilderness for three and a half years after Jesus was caught? We don't have any concept of that. That doesn't exist in the Bible, right? So couldn't be something about three and a half years. The interesting thing is, is even even in the second century, people like Hippolytus and other cons, uh, other people that were. Uh, that were educated by disciples of the disciples and so forth. I mean, they, they knew this day year principle that they can look back and say, wait a minute, the day is actually converted into a year. And then things start to fit like a hand in a glove. And they were literally like in the second century showing uh, the Sunday uh, Bible study, how those writers were saying, that means there's an antichrist and we're living in the time he's writing in the second century when the antichrist will show up because the antichrist comes from pagan Rome and then transfers into this religious Rome. And they were talking about it. It's like, so it seems to me that we're living in X, Y, Z right now. 
and that 1,260 years will come. That's amazing. You see how we can take the Bible principles and look back in, a, in agreement with God's people. Because why? Because the Holy Spirit guides each one of them all the way from the beginning and all the way till the end. You understand? Does that make sense? What's it say in 2 Timothy 3.16? All scripture has been inspired. That's right. Right? So we can take those principles and put them into our own personal life and apply it. And that's how we stay in biblical understandings and principles. We don't sway from those things. No matter what anybody says, thus says the Lord. And if he doesn't say it, therefore, there is no reason to put it into our mind and our principles. People can say it all day long. They can put principles out there all day long. But if it doesn't speak it in the word of God, we don't put ourselves in those, on those foundations. Do you know why? The devil wants to make sure that we find some other kind of uh, slippery slope to go wander off into. And if we start wandering off from principles that don't stay with the Bible, very soon, then we can start unraveling in our own mind, in our own concept, our own principles, and our own opinions. You understand? So this is very important. I mean, and this, this principle has a beginning with Bible prophecy, with the concept that there's a timeline that's behind each one of those principles. And that teaches us to stay focused on the Bible. So as, as it continues on, we're in Revelation chapter 12. We're just uh, running over the verses again. So it says there in verse 6 again, it says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God, that they should keep her there 1,260 days. You understand? So then verse 7 starts with a, with a different concept. And we'll, later on, we'll, we'll unpack these concepts. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Is that, a, is that Michael the archangel? Is that an angel that uh, is just like Gabriel? Why wouldn't that angel be Gabriel? Why wouldn't it? Why would it be Jesus? What does the Bible say? Yeah. And I can find it in the Bible. You know that, right? You can find that in Joshua five. You can find it in. Daniel chapter 10, you can find that in Jude, I think it is, or Titus, I think it's Titus, Titus, in, in 1 Thessalonians 16, you can find those words, Michael the Archangel, and all those areas, there is no way, you have to understand the concept of who Satan is, in, in the order of, of structure that comes from the, from the heavenly realm. Because Lucifer was the highest angel that sat next to Jesus Christ, a created being. Mike, Michael, not the created being. Lucifer, the created being. You understand? And he was a cherub next to Jesus Christ, next to the Father, an overseer of the law of God. He was the most spectacular created being that was ever created. Now, he was this in the kingdom of heaven. When Michael fought with his angels and, and fought the devil and his angels, he was cast out of heaven. Did he lose his position? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did he lose his power? No. 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 You understand? He lost his position. Who's the, who's the most powerful angel in the universe? Satan is, I guess. He's they, an angel. That's correct. You know, he's more powerful than Gabriel. We read that in Daniel chapter 10, that, that Gabriel is fighting with, and Michael the archangel had to come and, and, and supersede the devil. That tells us that there is no created being that can fight the devil. Only the divine can fight the devil. Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's Mike. Even so, see, it only indicates. Right. There's a statement in the spirit of prophecy that says, even 
Today he has 20 Yeah. Power to yeah, because he's been doing this a long time. He's got a lot of experience in his belt. He's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent. He's, he's not all powerful. You know, that's why he has wicked angels. He is, he's not busy with us. You think the devil's really busy with us? He's got better things to do. He assigns us angels. Wicked angel. You know, he's busy in other places. I'm not going to mention where, but, you know, he's busy in other places. He's not all seen and can see. He's, you know, we, we miss that concept. We think he is. He's a created being. You understand? So in that concept, we have to understand that Michael the Archangel is Jesus Christ. And every time Michael the Archangel comes up, it seems to be that it's in a battle. There's always a battle going on. Whenever Michael the Archangel comes, pops up and we see those that phrase there's a battle going on isn't that the chief commander of all the angels would be right i mean that's jesus christ i've been told so many times that no michael is a special angel and it's like well in daniel chapter 12 that's impossible because <laughs> no angel is coming to save the people save the prince of his people only jesus can you understand? I mean, it's, but this is a very misconstrued and mis, misrepresented concept. Let's go on. Verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out. His angels were cast out with him. Okay? Verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast out. What is Satan? What is that in Greek? Satan. What does that mean? It says it right there. Who's been cast down? It, the accuser. That's what saw a And they overcame him with the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony that they did not love their lives even unto the death. You know what that means? They would they would rather lose their life than their relationship with God. Isn't that isn't that powerful? Uh -huh. Isn't that? Wow. I don't know. And, and everyone in telephone land, mute your phones because somebody's snoring or something. Uh -huh. Really? Well, it's somebody's phone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think. Or it's. Yeah. <laughs> I would maybe not. I don't know. Uh, yeah, anyways, moving on. <laughs> okay, so verse 12, therefore rejoice, O heaven, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea and the devil, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath. Because why? Because he knows his That's time is short. short. Time. So did, did, Luce, did, did Satan be completely eradicated at the cross? No. Couldn't have. Because why? This is, you know, verse 10 is right where Jesus is crucified. Do you understand that? Yeah, right after he had been crucified. And then he, he and then he appears in heaven. Remember, uh, there's Psalms 24 tells us about, you know, lift up your gates, O Lord, you know, and tells us about this wonderful, uh, 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 moment when jesus and the angels show up after he the war hero mighty in battle comes back to heaven that you find in acts chapter one when jesus is taken by the clouds wow. and and they escort him back to heaven right so wouldn't that then verse 10 be another and the same announcement saying now i heard a loud voice where saying in heaven what now now that's a timeline, isn't it? Now, salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, what? Have come. 
Because why? He had victory over the cross. Right? So verse 12 would be after the cross. Therefore, what's that therefore? What is that therefore? Because of what we're reading in chapter, or I mean verse 11 and 10, right? Therefore, rejoice, O heaven. Why? Because the devil had been cast out of heaven. For finally, finally, you know, you read in Job chapter 1 and 2 that Lucifer or Satan shows up as what? As a representative, as a son of God, or as, as one of the sons representing the world, the planet. And he says, what are you here for? What, what do you come here for? And he says, from walking to and fro. From what? The earth. So did he have access to heaven back then in Job? Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. But he had limited access, didn't he? Because he deceived in, in the Garden of Eden. Right? So he still had access to heaven in the book of Job. Right? So here at the cross, this is where Satan is completely done with in the kingdom of heaven. They're done. They are done. And now he has no access to heaven. Does that make sense? Do you understand that? It, it's a process. God is working. So, so it's like the devil was able to roam around the universe roam around in heaven, you know, or at least to the gates. But then the Lord restricted him from the heavens. And then the Lord restricts him from the universe. Where is he getting them down to? He's getting them honed down to one spot to where he can just eradicate them. And so where does he end up? Where does he, where is he cast out? Right where he claims. So, so Jesus is the one that makes the claim here. That is my, that the planet earth is my kingdom. And that's what he takes over. It's mine. And now he's got the devil narrowed down with quarantine to this planet. Because look what it says. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, heavens, and you who dwell in them. Why? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath. Why? Why does he have great wrath? Because he knows his time is short. Why is his time short? Because it's almost over with. You know, this is sanctuary language, right? This is sanctuary language. So there's something that's going to happen to the devil. So was he eradicated at the cross? Mm -hmm. Couldn't have been. Yeah. It's impossible. According to the Bible. Go ahead, Mary. I just wanted to say that um, the reason he was just um, quarantining as you said to this earth is because he lost his influence with all the angels yeah right right and and they saw what he did at the cross I mean if he can if he can go that far with God <laughs> mm -mm, it's over and they finally saw it. it's over it's over there so they make a choice that you ain't coming here man yeah, they're not listening to him. You understand? So he's he's been narrowed down to this planet. Boy, that's why it's like a woe. That's why there's a woe in that verse. Because a woe is serious, is it not? Has he not been causing destruction? You know, I get told by people, Satan has no teeth, Dave. He's just a, he's just a lion with no teeth. He's just gnawing around. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> really? I could see some serious destruction going on. Are you going to blame God for the war in Ukraine? Are you going to blame God when, when destruction happens to people, when people die, when people are murdered? When people, is that God's fault? Who is that? Really? It's not, it looks like he's got teeth to me, and it says that in James. For what? The devil roams around like a roaring lion. What, toothless? With gums? Does he got gingivitis or something? I mean, what? Really? Really? Now, for the person who believes in the Lord Jesus, even them can be persecuted. Can they not? I, I read a lot of people have been slaughtered and murdered in the name of Jesus Christ. Now that's after the cross. Yeah. So is he gumless? I mean, is he toothless and, and just full of gums and got gingivitis and he can't do any harm? <laughs> really? Really, you go talk to people who have been slaughtered and murdered. You just go talk to the Jews who were slaughtered and murdered during Hitler's time. You know, talk to the Ukrainians who were slaughtered and murdered during 
uh, Joseph Stalin's time. Tell me that there is no devil roaming around like a roaring lion, seeking who he can devour. It, it makes no sense. But see, once again, people put in their minds their own perceptions, their own concepts, and they walk with that. It's like, but what does the word of God say? What does that say? I'll stick with that. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Yeah, God. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's right. And God allows him to go so far and only so far. Okay, so verse 13. Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast down to earth, he what? He persecuted the woman who gave birth because he has only gums, right? He only he, he pulled out his dentures, and now he's got gingivitis, and he's just gnawing on everyone, right? Is that what it says? No, he persecuted who? The church. The woman. The woman who gave birth to the male child. Same woman, right? But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished. There it is. There's what Kathy was bringing up for a time, times and half a time. Is that the same as 1,260 days? You convert that into years. There was no time in after Jesus was crucified for a, literally three and a half years that they were persecuted. <laughs> Are you serious? They were persecuted for decades for centuries weren't they it's impossible this is the timeline that you convert you convert from a day to a year okay so that's 1260 years right and it was from the presence of the serpent so he's he's orchestrating the whole thing so the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like the flood after the woman and he might that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. He's just trying to drown this woman. He's trying to silence her, right? But the earth, interesting words here, but the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Out of his mouth. And the and this is the key right here. This is one of the main themes of revelation chapter 12 and the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest or the remnant of her seed who who what who are the remnant of the woman who keep the commandments of god who keep the commandments of god and have the testimony of jesus christ revelation yeah. nineteen ten tells us that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. You understand? Okay, so that's the that's the broad sweep, the flyover of Revelation chapter 12. Now we, we already unpack last time, and we can start in our handouts. And uh, yeah, we uh, unpacked last time um, some concepts. One of the concepts about Revelation chapter 12 is that um, we had three centers of, of focus that come from the Old Testament. There was three stories. Remember the uh, Old Testament stories? Why are we focused on the Old Testament stories about Revelation 12? What does it say in verse 1? That there's a woman that's clothed with what? The, the moon and the stars, right? And when you look back into the Old Testament, you can see that it gives light to the New Testament. Okay? You can actually start putting pieces together in Revelation 12, a lot easier when you go back to the Old Testament and see the concepts or the stories that are there in the Old Testament. And there's three of them in the Old Testament that give very clear details that help us paint a bigger picture to understand what Revelation 12 is describing. And the three Old Testament stories are that of the center of focus or the backgrounds that are the key to understand Revelation 12. Those center of focus, first off, is the child. And that's where you begin to unpack Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, is the woman and the child. So who's that child? Remember we talked about that? It's Jesus, right? And the child doesn't stay forever as a child. And that child was caught up to God in his throne. That's what it says there in uh, Revelation chapter 12. So the center of focus is Jesus, who is the child. And then we describe or we discuss that um, that. Only 7 through 12, Revelation chapter 12, 
7 through 12 is an amplification. It describes even more details about verses 1 through 5, okay? And so we read those verses. So Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, is, is a verse that's amplified further in Revelation chapter 12, verses 13 and 16. So what it says in chapter or in verse 6 is amplified even more in verses 13 and 16. And verse 6 is the introduction for verses 13 to 16. And verses 13 and 16 is an amplification. And the theme about that is about the woman. Okay? So the, so the dragon is enraged with the woman, and it goes to make war not with the child anymore. It's not with the woman anymore. But the very end in verse 13, 17 is with the remnant, that is the seed seed. So you have three centers of focus or stories that come from the old testament the first one you would have to go back to genesis chapter 3 verse 15 in order to understand what the seed is who the seeds are who the serpent is who the woman is okay and then the next story is the story of the exodus when you go back and study the story of exodus you understand a little bit more the, the talking points that God is bringing up in the story of Exodus. You can literally directly link over to Revelation chapter 12. And today we're going to, we unpack a lot of the Revelate or the Genesis 315. But today we're going to unpack the, uh, the story of the Exodus. Okay. Um, and then the last one is the story of Elijah. You cannot understand chapter 12 of Revelation without understanding the story that Elijah brings. Because there's a woman, there's an Elijah, there's an Elijah there, there is a king there, there is all these stories that are brought up in the Elijah story that directly links to Revelation chapter 12. And the more and more you put these Old Testament pieces together, the more the story of Revelation 12 becomes clearer and clearer. For our time, do you understand? So you take the Old Testament stories and you start piecing those together. They have the same talking points, the same sound bites as Revelation 12. Those three, Genesis 3.15, the Exodus story in, in the book of Exodus, and then the Elijah story, okay? And in Genesis 3.15, just really quickly, um, we understood what uh, the first backdrop is, which is... Um, when it starts out that God goes and speaks to the serpent, who's an agent of who? The serpent is who in, in the story of Genesis 3.15? Who's, who's, the, who's the serpent? He's an agent of who? Yeah. Of Satan, right? So Genesis 3.15, we have a backdrop there. It's, and so um, Adam and Eve are listening, okay? Because when he lines them all up, Adam and Eve are listening. And this is a gospel message. So there, he's relaying it to them, but he's speaking to the serpent. And this is the first messianic prophecy found in the Bible is Genesis 3.15. Okay, and listen to what it says. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed, he's talking to the serpent, and her, that is the woman's seed, right? No, the first part of that backdrop story is the first one is enmity so there's there's four of these in that story enmity and then about the serpent and then about the woman and about the serpent seed and then the woman seed you understand so the seeds the woman enmity and the serpent four of them okay inside the genesis story you will find these exact four backdrops Inside Revelation 12. Does Revelation 12 have a woman? Yeah. Revelation 12 have a woman. Does it have a serpent? Yeah. Does Genesis have a woman and a serpent? Yeah. Yeah. See what I'm saying? And is there a seed of the woman? Literally says that in Revelation 12. Is there a seed? Is there the seed seeds? In, yeah. Is there a seed of the serpent in Revelation 12? Yeah. Okay. You understand? So this is a concept that's directly related to Revelation 12. That's why Revelation 12 needs to go back to the Old Testament in order to understand the, the story 
of what Revelation 12 is bringing out. So that's the four elements. Enmity, serpent, woman, two seeds. All right? Now, uh, we don't have to go through that. I'm not going to go in, into that anymore. Because what we're going to understand today is as we broke down Genesis 3.15, now we go to the next story, which is the Exodus backdrop, okay? So today we're going to understand a little bit about the Exodus backdrop. The Exodus backdrop, remember I was telling you about the, um, the understanding of a, a typological discussion or a typological um, verses that are in the Bible. As and so. So there's a type and an anti-type. And all through the biblical prophecies, not, oh, I can't say all of them, but many of them um, have this, this, this precept or this uh, principle, which is type, anti-type. And in order to understand what that means, you go back to Matthew 24, where Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, there's the as, there's the type, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. So there's a type, which is Noah, and an anti-type, before the coming of the Son of Man. You understand? So there's this type, anti-type. You have this also in the backdrop in Exodus story that is directly related to Revelation 12. So here's a, here it is. So God's Old Testament bride, here's the prophecy of Exodus 12, or I mean in Exodus. God's Old Testament bride is compared to a beautiful woman. Did you know that? So is there a woman in, in Revelation 12? Yes. So... Uh, a woman in biblical prophecy is compared to the Old Testament bride. You understand? Go to Jeremiah chapter 6. Go to Jeremiah 6 real quick. You can see directly that God is speaking about his bride. What is Jeremiah known as in the Bible? You know what he's known as? What, what his identification is? He's the weeping prophet. You know why he's the weeping prophet? Because he's a prophet just before Babylon comes and takes away the Israelite people. And he's there to warn them and warn them. And they ignore him. They throw him in a miry pit. They, they torture him. It's just, the poor guy is just ravaged. But anyway, so he's known as the weeping prophet. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 2. What does it say there? Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 2. And I have likened the daughter of Zion as to a lovely and delicate woman. You see that? God's people is known as a woman in biblical prophecy. Uh, what does it say uh, in um, husbands love your wives as Christ loved who? The church. You church. see that? You see, you can go to, uh, well, it's right here in Jeremiah 31. Verse uh, 32, go to Jeremiah 31, verse 32. Just unpacking a little bit so you can see the principles aren't just coming off the top of somebody's head. Verse 32, Jeremiah 31, verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I have made with their fathers in that day that I have took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, uh, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. A husband must have what? A wife. You can't be an imaginary husband. Wouldn't last very long, right? So here's some understanding about the prophecies. Uh, one of the prophecies, God, in, in Exodus chapter 19, God married Israel in the Old Testament. If you go read Re Exodus chapter 19, you can see the whole thing is like a marriage ceremony. The woman is God's bride, and the father implanted Jesus into the womb of Mary. That is what it's implying, just as he implanted the child into the woman who was about to give birth, so he did back there in Exodus 19. So let's read that. The fulfillment here in Revelation 12, verse 1. God's bride is the church. Jesus was the seed of Abraham and, Abraham and, and David. Jesus once said that salvation is of the Jews. You find this in John chapter 4. So in other words, Jesus was born from what? When you're reading Revelation 12, verse 1, you're reading about Jesus being born of the woman who would therefore be God's Old Testament people. So Jesus was born from the lineage of the Jewish nation that is from the Old Testament church. When you read, go back to Revelation chapter 12. When you read this, you have to ask yourself this question. Who comes first, the woman or the child? 
It's a kind of a woman. ridiculous question, isn't it? Now, a great sign appeared in heaven and a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head was a 12 garland of, or a garland of 12 stars. What comes first? In order to have a baby, you need a woman. <laughs> Do you understand this, the simple logic in this? So Revelation 12, one, God's bride here is the Old Testament church. Jesus was the seed of Abraham and David. Jesus once said that salvation is of the Jews. In other words, Jesus was born from the lineage of the Jewish nation. That is from the Old Testament church. Was the seed the seed of the Old Testament? Was the seed the seed of the Old Testament? Yeah. Jesus is the seed of the Old Testament. Of course he was. He was born from the woman in Revelation 12, verse 1. And that is the Old Testament church. So now we have a little bit of understanding. We're starting to paint a picture of what Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 is speaking of. So the prophecy here, another one, God's people were crying out in travail in the Old Testament, in the Exodus, because of the bitter bondage to the of the cruel uh, taskmasters. You find that in Exodus chapter 1. Israel was longing for a birth and deliverer. Go to Exodus chapter 2 real quick. Exodus chapter 2, look at that. See, in this paints a picture has he, having a direct lineage or linkage to Revelation chapter 12. It says there, Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 to, tw uh, to, to uh, 25. Now it happened in the process of time that the kings of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they came and they cried out, and they and their cry came up to God because of their bondage. So God heard their groaning. Are they groaning here? Were they groaning in Revelation chapter 12? They were groaning for a deliverer, right? And God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked up at the upon or looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged them. Is that the same kind of language that you have there in Revelation chapter 12? You might want to just. Hold your finger there at Revelation 12 as we keep flipping back and forth because, you know, we'll keep comparing the two in order to understand this. Because in Revelation chapter 12, um, it says there, then being with child, verse 2, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. You see the same language there? So as it was in, in the prophecy in, in Exodus chapter 2, we have the same thing in Revelation chapter 12. People were in bondage in Exodus in a strange land. If they were not delivered, the promise of the sea could not be fulfilled. Did you know that? If they were not delivered, the prophecy. So was the devil behind this trying to hold back bondage in Exodus? Yeah. Was he holding back in Revelation chapter 12? Was he trying to what? He was trying to what? Devour the child as soon as it was born, right? So the fulfillment. When Jesus was about to be born in this world, the whole of humanity was in bondage to sin and it groaned and the people were seeking for deliverance. When was that? During Jesus's time. And didn't Isaiah and other prophecies prophesy of this coming? Emmanuel, God with us, for you have a virgin that will be born or will give birth to, right? Do you understand how this, you'd go look back in the Old Testament and you start putting pieces together about Revelation chapter 12. Uh, John chapter eight, verses 32 to 34 and Hebrews chapter four, uh, chapter two, verses 14 and 15 has this understanding. Verses uh, 14 in Hebrews chapter two, it says, inasmuch then as the children are partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, and through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who thought, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Did Jesus not come to release the sinners from bondage? Yes, he did at True. the cross. So Revelation 2 or 12 verse 2 depicts the woman's condition. The woman was in travail, longing for a deliverer. We just read that. Those are birth pains. That is the human race crying out for a deliverer. Who would be, this, who would be the savior of the world? And he would be born. 
Do you see that? It's, and it's going in a timeline. Where would you find that in the Bible, in the New Testament? Well, you go look in Luke. You'll look in Matthew. You'll look in the Gospels. You could find that Jesus was born, right? Literally from a woman. But it's not talking about Mary because she didn't run into the wilderness for three and a half years. This is talking about the old. Did the Old Testament church exist before Jesus was born? Yes. You see how this works? All right. So now another prophecy. Israel was enslaved by the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh in the Old Testament is known as the great dragon. Do we have a great dragon in Revelation chapter 12? Ezekiel 29, verse 3, in the King James says, Speak and say, thus saith, saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the Pharaoh king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers. Is there a river in Revelation chapter 12? The mouth of the dragon spewed out like a great flood. Right, which he said, my river is my own, and I have made it for myself. You see how the concept in the Old Testament is unpacking what we can read. See, this is how you understand biblical prophecies in, in the book of Revelation. If you go back to the Old Testament and you go find these stories so you can paint the picture and get more pieces of the puzzle so you can have a clear understanding of what it's talking about. So the fulfillment of that in, in the understanding that the enslavement was enslaved by the Pharaoh, the great dragon. Well, God's people were uh, enslaved by the accuser of the brethren, the great dragon, the ancient serpent, the devil called Satan, right? We read that in verse three, four, and nine, and another, uh, and there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his head and a tail uh, and his tail drew a third of the star, part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to give birth to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Do you see that? Do you see that the devil was waiting for who to be born? Jesus. Jesus to devour him. So Jesus is being born from the Old Testament church. In verse 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out unto the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Right? Notice here, there is two dragons here. There's two dragons. There's the great red dragon, and then there's the great dragon. One is that terrible beast we find in Daniel chapter 7. That is the fourth beast. And who is the fourth beast? Rome. Rome. Both pagan and papal Rome. We find that in history. That red dragon is the agent of the great old dragon known as the devil, Satan. Do you understand that? Does the devil, did the devil have agents in, or an agent in Genesis 3.15? Yeah, the serpent. The serpent. Yeah, the serpent. You understand? Genesis 3.15. Yeah, did the, if the devil showed up as what he is, would he convince anybody? Would he if, if we saw the devil as he as he is, would we be convinced to follow him? <laughs> Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So he puts he puts himself behind agents. You see that? Because we'd be more compelled to follow agents. You understand? So the devil was an agent, or the devil had an agent in pagan Rome. You understand that? Pagan Rome is a direct link to the devil. I mean, was, were they not worshiping devil practices, other gods? Yeah, that's why it's called pagan. Hello. And then it transferred into a more religious church state, which was papal. Okay. Did anything change? No. The concepts still say the same. They just put a, a stamp of Christianity on it. Do you understand? Does that make sense? And here's the one thing that's important, too, to understand, that that great fiery red dragon has seven heads. The great dragon has one head. One of the heads is spewing out water. You understand? One head, because one seven heads have how many mouths? Seven mouths. One of those heads is spewing out water. Do you understand? It's an agent of the devil. Does the devil have seeds? Yeah. Go back to Genesis chapter four. 
Who is the seed there of the devil? Cain. Did he, did he murder Abel? Was it Abel a seed of God? Was the devil trying to get rid of the seed? Do you understand? Does, it, does this make sense? You see, you can go back to the Old Testament and start painting a picture. So another prophecy. A deliverer was born of a woman whose name was Moses. You find that in Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Right? We don't have to read that. I mean, we can. You want to read it? You know, we don't, we don't have, you can, you can go back and read that. Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, talks about that there was a deliverer who was born of a woman. And that who was Moses. Right? So the fulfillment was a male child born of a woman. There it is. Man, Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. Matthew 2 shows that, a, 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 that the male child was born of a woman. Who was that deliverer? The seed. In this concept, it's the seed. Capital C. Or I mean capital S. The woman at this stage represents the Jewish church. Jesus was the seed of Abraham and David. This means that Jesus was born from the Old Testament church. For this reason, Jesus said to the Samaritan woman that salvation is of the Jews. You understand? God has his people in the Jewish nation, but the Jewish nation lost its relationship with God as a nation when? In 70 AD, right? Then, well, I, well no, they, they're the, the destruction of Jerusalem was in 70 AD. You understand that? That was it. It's done. So what happened? So then the Gospels went to who? The Gentiles. Gentiles. You understand? Okay. So another prophecy, Pharaoh fears to lose his throne to the deliverer. That's in Exodus chapter 1, verses 22. The Pharaoh was afraid that he's going to lose his throne. Did not Herod have fear to lose his throne? Because, you know, they said, you know, there's a king out here, and uh, we were, were trying to find him. So he's got fear that there's another king that's trying to usurp his throne, right? So what happens? The Pharaoh kills the infants in order to get rid of the deliverer. But Moses is protected in Egypt. You see that? You can go read that in Exodus chapter 1. And the fulfillment? Well, it's in Revelation chapter two, uh, 12. It's also in Matthew 2, verses 16. All the infants were killed by who? By Herod to get rid of the deliverer. Did the devil have an agent? Who was that agent? Herod. So the dragon stood before the woman to devour the child as soon as it was born. You know what that's called? It's in history. It's called the massacre of the innocent. That literally happened. It's written in history. So another prophecy. This is all about the, book, the story of Exodus relating to uh, Revelation chapter 12. You can see the same concepts here, okay? God called Moses and Israel out of Egypt, did he not? He said, get out of there, right? Jesus was protected in Egypt from where he was called out of Egypt at a certain time when, when Herod died. When Herod died, an angel came and said, okay, you can bring the child back because it's time. And that prophecy was attributed to Jesus Christ. You find this in Hosea 11, uh, 11 verse uh, 1. In Hosea, if you go back to Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, it says, when, the, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. You see that? There's the type. Where's the anti-type? When Jesus is when Joseph was told by the angel, you can bring the child back because Herod had died. You understand? Now, another one. The death of the lamb marks the deliverance. Isn't that what Moses did in, in Exodus chapter 12? He brought a lamb as a sacrifice, right? G now, the fulfillment of that, Jesus is presented by John as the lamb of God before his baptism. And Paul tells us that Jesus is our Passover. You see the prophecy and the fulfillment is Jesus Christ. Right? So another prophecy, Israel was baptized in the Red Sea. Was it not? You can find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul directly states that that Red Sea was the baptism of Israel. Right? In the fulfillment, Jesus was baptized, baptized in the Jordan River. You see the concept here? Now, this one I find really amazing. Uh, the prophecy that the face of Moses, when he goes and, and spends time with God, 
up on Mount Sinai. It shone from the mountain as he spoke with God, as he talked to God. It got so bad that the people didn't even want to look at Moses anymore. So he had to go put a veil on him to talk to the people because his face shone so so brightly. And so it says it there in Exodus 34, verse 29 to 34. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. <laughs> Isn't that funny how they do that to Moses, how afraid they were to go and just, if they would just have faith in God, they could spend time with God directly. But they, they were so scared. Then Moses called them, uh, called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near and gave them, and he gave them commandments, at, uh, commandments, all that the Lord had spoken with him on the Mount of Sinai, on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak to him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And he would come out and speak to the children of Israel wherever he had been commanded. So he had to keep putting this veil on because the people were so afraid of the brightness of the glory of the Lord. Isn't that sad, really? I find that kind of sad. But the fulfillment, this is interesting. The face of Jesus shone upon the Mount of Transfiguration as he heard the voice of God. And you find that in John 1, 14. In Matthew 17, 1 through 3, it says this, now in six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led him up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, look at this, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, appeared to them talking with Jesus. That's amazing. So it shows that there's two concepts here, Moses and and Elijah. This is very important for the end time. You have two of God's servants that are, on, are in the focus here in Revelation 12 as well, because you have the concept of the Egypt or the exodus, exodus, which is the concept with Moses, and you also will be learning later the concept of Elijah inside Revelation chapter 12. And here in Matthew 17, they appear in the presence of of the three disciples as they see Jesus speaking with them, Elijah and Moses. That's amazing to me because the interesting part is Moses was present at the Mount as was Elijah at the Mount. What a, and what is the significance of this encounter in Matthew 17? That Moses represents those who were buried and had fell asleep and are going to be resurrected. It's Michael who fought over the body against Satan and prevailed. So we know that Moses was buried and then Jesus came and fought Satan. There you go again. Another one about uh, another piece of the evidence that shows only Jesus can fight Satan and took Moses, right? So we know Moses is in heaven. And then there's this other part where Elijah he never saw death, right? All three, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration because they're going to be trans. You know where you can find that sound or that, that word, transfiguration, the whole concept of that? It's in 1 Corinthians 15 when you won't, you, you uh, I, can't, I can't mince the words. I don't like mincing those words. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where it says, uh, uh, Behold, verse 30, 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but all shall be uh, changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must be put, must put on for this corruptible must put on incorrupt, cor corruption and the mortal must be must put on immortality. That's when they receive it. The ones who die in Christ will receive immortality 
And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, it tells us about those who are asleep in Jesus will rise first, and those who are alive and remain will see Jesus Christ in the air. That's the concept that you find in the Mount of Transfiguration. It's a little, listen to this, listen to this. It's a miniature representation of those at the very end of time who were asleep and are asleep in Jesus and will awake to those who never, and, and awake and those who will never see death, who are faithful in Jesus Christ. Do you see that? That's awesome. So what you have there in Matthew chapter 17 is a miniature representation of what will happen at the end time when Jesus shows up to take his people home. Isn't that beautiful? And you find this concept right there in Revelation chapter 12, okay? Moses intercedes for the people. Here's another one, offering his own life. Isn't that what he did? He did. He said, Lord, because the Lord was going to just strike down. He's so sick and tired of these guys. And Moses said, no, 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 no. Take me. Isn't that what Jesus said? Jesus is the great intercessor in favor of his sinful people. See the concept? Prophecy and then a fulfillment. Um, one more, I think. One more or two more. Um, Moses organized the 12 tribes, did he not? And established the 70 to carry on the work of Israel. In the fulfillment, Jesus chose 12 and sent out carry, uh, 70 to carry out his work. You see how this prophecy is fulfilled in Jesus? Um, one more or two more. Moses died, was buried by God and resurrected by Christ and ascended to heaven. In the fulfillment, fulfillment, Jesus died, was buried, was resurrected and ascended to heaven. You see that? And another one in Deuteronomy chapter 18 uh, there's a pro it was spoken there that the promise uh, given to the Israelites is one greater than Moses and the fulfillment as Jesus is the prophecy greater than Moses. He, he was fulfilled. So do you think this is all a coincidence? You can put picture all, I don't think that this is a coincidence. This is not a coincidence. Did you find all these things in the Old Testament that are fulfilling in the New Testament? You know what also that reveals to me that it's the same God then and it is the same God now that there, there it's impossible for the Bible to be something that is um, just a regular old book, that there's something truly supernatural here because you have people, true. you have people referring to the same God, having reference to the same Old Testament people. You got Peter talking about Jeremiah. You got Jesus quoting Daniel. You understand what I'm saying? That there is something supernatural that, that no other book has this concept in the world at all. There ha you have to prove to me that the Bible in this concept is a foolish, just fa fairy, fairy tale fantasy land book that has no concept at all. Because obviously somebody wrote this and they are, there's, it's impossible for them to be what? 3,485 years old or so or more. You understand what I'm saying? This is a supernatural book. And we can show that obviously it's the same Holy Spirit that reaches out to every single one of the writers. And that's beautiful. It's the same Holy Spirit that we can. That means it's the same Holy Spirit that I can have with me. That had it with the same Bible writers. Isn't that beautiful? So this is not a coincidence. It's as subtle as a freight train that there's these Old Testament prophecies and Revelation 12 fulfills it and describes it and explains it. So in summary, literal Moses brings literal deliverance to a literal Israel from literal bondage in literal Egypt by offering a literal lamb took them across a literal desert, brings literal water from a literal rock and literal manna from heaven and raises up a literal servant to prevent literal death and leads literal Israel to the borders of literal Canaan. So is this all fulfilled literally? Mm -hmm. No. 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 The symbology is fulfilled in Jesus. It is clear that the story of Moses was fulfilled on a larger scale in Jesus. All this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ for the entire human world, not just some people in a desert. It is obvious 
that what was literal and local in the Old Testament, Israel, is to be understood as a spiritual and worldwide sense today. Doesn't that make sense? And in this process, you can understand why God is presenting to us what he plans to do. He does this in types and stories in order for us to uh, obtain it in our own personal lives and to understand that truly there is a God and we walk with him. Because if, uh, if he promised Israel the land of Canaan back then, therefore I can guarantee that he's going to promise me if I walk with him a spiritual Canaan when he comes in the same like manner, right? That's as far as I'm going to go because the rest of it, we're going to, the next time we come, we're going to understand the four elements of Genesis 3.15. We're going to unpack those because this gives us even more insight about Revelation chapter 12, which remembers enmity, the woman, right? The serpent and the two seeds. Her, his yes, her seed and his seed, and I'll tell you the the crushing of the or the bruising of the heel and the crushing of the head. Oh man, I didn't realize it until I started studying it. How misconception people have of this in the Christian world, which is interesting. And the only way you can really put it in its true perspective is through the sanctuary. It's the only way. And when you study the sanctuary, you can understand what that means as a promise. And it is, it's a promise. So we'll unpack that next time. So I don't know about you, but I know about me that I love prophecy for these reasons right here. It, it reveals to us that there is a God in heaven and he loves us. He tells us ahead of time so that we may follow him. So if it's, it's in, your, in your mind as it is with me, uh, oh, yeah, I guess we're going to sing first. Huh? We're going to sing a song, a hymn. Let's take our hymnal, turn to 618, and please stand as we sing. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. <clears throat> 618, and stand as we sing. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army he shall lead, till Every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call, obey. Forth to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Ye that are his now serve him against one numbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. He dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor and watching unto prayer. Where duty calls or danger, but be never wanting there. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To him that overcometh a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory 
shall reign eternally. What a promise that is. Mm -hmm. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your promises. Lord, I just pray that each one of us here are blessed throughout the week and we ponder on you constantly, day in and day out, and that you bring us back together again next Sabbath as we open up your word again and understand your scriptures. And I thank you so much for all these things that you do for us, Lord. Bless each one of us here. Bless those who are in the, on the telephone listening. Bless those who are listening on Zoom and watching. Bless each one around the world. Lord, I thank you so much for all the visitors. And I pray that you uh, bless each one and guide us. And we say all this in your precious son's name, the name above all names, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Thank you for joining well, thank us. Thank you, everybody. Have a blessed Sabbath and keep me in your prayers as you are all in mine. Yes. God bless you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. God bless. <laughs>